All right, everyone, welcome back to the channel. In this video, we will cover a high yield review of pancreatic endocrine tumors and MEN syndromes. Now this topic is particularly high yield at all levels of USMLE exams, as they love to go after these tumors and the types of syndromes that they can present in. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll start first with a differential diagnosis. So when you think of pancreatic endocrine tumors, what differentials come to mind? And I'll pause and give you a second to think. Okay, rather than reviewing the answers typically like we do in the normal differentials, we'll go ahead and do a practice question to solidify these differentials that you've come up with. A 55-year-old male presents to the clinic for routine follow-up. He has no significant past medical history and was previously healthy. His family's history is significant for a MEN1 gene mutation in his father. He has noticed a new rash in addition to recurrent diarrheal episodes. His laboratory studies are remarkable for a fasting blood glucose of 170, um, but it's otherwise unrevealing. Vital signs are unremarkable. Physical exam reveals a blistering rash involving bilateral extremities. Which of the following would best explain his symptoms? A, insulinoma, B, VIPoma, C, glucagonoma, D, somatostatinoma, E, gastronoma, or F, adenocarcinoma. I'll pause again while you think through this. So the answer for this one was a C, glucagonoma. And so the key points that you want to think about for this one were the MEN1 hint here, the new rash, the recurrent diarrheal illness, and the elevated blood glucose. And so we'll talk through each of these in detail now and how you can separate them apart. So this is the differential diagnosis that we had in the first slide. So if you notice adenocarcinoma is out, that's kind of a separate tumor. These are specifically the endocrine types of tumors in the pancreas. And so we split these into the cell type, the hormone they produce generally, and the high yield presentation or features you need to be aware of. So insulinomas are pretty straightforward. So the cell is the beta cell, which is what produces insulin normally. The hormone that it produces is insulin. So this is like a, what a, if you think of a normal functioning beta cell, this is an overactivation in these tumors. And so the high yield that, to be aware of is Whipple's triad, which is a very, very self-explanatory triad. So really it's just remembering the name Whipple because Whipple is involved in a lot of different things. Um, but the triad is pretty self-explanatory. Hypoglycemia, so the opposite of what we had in our example, Symptoms of hypoglycemia, which you know would be um, hunger, um, fatigue, dizziness, lightheadedness, mental status disturbances, things of that nature, and then symptom resolution with glucose normalization. So if you've ever seen a patient or a practice question with hypoglycemia, when you give them glucose, you rapidly improve the mental disturbances and all the other symptoms. Then we have VIP omas. And so these, the cell type's a little odd. It's parasympathetic ganglia. So they would not likely to ask you that. The hormone itself is a VIP, vaso vasoactive intestinal peptide, which is very high yield. And then the classic triad is watery diarrhea, achlorhydria, and hypokalemia. And this triad makes sense as well. So watery diarrhea as VIPs, one of its primary functions is to increase permeability and cause increased fluid response into the GI system. The hypokalemia comes from the profuse diarrhea. In people who have profuse diarrhea, often you become hypokalemic. And achlorhydria is due to the VIP suppressed gastric acid production. Um, so that's the triad to know with VIP OMA. So neither of these have looked like the problem that we had in the last question. Next, we get to glucagonoma. So these are the alpha cells. So in contrast to the beta cells, keep that straight. That glucagon comes from the alpha cells. Um, and the hormone is glucagon, and it's the exact opposite of an insulinoma. So you'll have hyperglycemia because glucagon stimulates glucose production in the bloodstream when people are starved of glucose. Diarrhea, again, due to osmotic issues with um, glucose. Psychiatric disturbances. And then what we saw in the last question was the necrolytic migratory erythema, which is extremely high yield. So if you see a blistering rash in a person with mental disturbances and hyperglycemia, definitely keep this high on the list of things you should be looking out for. Next, we have somatostatinoma which is less commonly tested because it's fairly rare, but somatostatin is normally produced by delta cells in the pancreas. And the high yield findings you need to be aware of are hyperglycemia, gallstones, and steatorrhea. 
And so this seems a little confusing if you look at somatostatinoma just at a glance. You may see, well, hyperglycemia may overlap with glucagon and steatorrhea may overlap with the next one, gastronoma. So how do I tell this apart and why is this occurring like this? So if you think of somatostatin as the stop sign that's blocking all of the pancreatic endocrine secretions, and really it's the stop sign of the endocrine system as a whole. So what it does is somatostatin will block the effects of insulin causing hyperglycemia. It will block the effects of CCK causing gallstones, and it will block the effects of pancreatic lipases causing steatorrhea. So there's other symptoms that you could be aware of, but these are the common ones they go after. And just keep in mind that if you're thinking about a somatostatinoma, think about any endocrine hormone in the body could be affected and could have a, the exact opposite of what that hormone no, normally does as the clinical presentation. And remember a, a high yield pearl here is that we of, often use somatostatin analogs such as octreotide to stop various endocrine hormones within the body in, in various tumors. So that's a clinical pearl that people use as an use somatostatin as an analog, as a medication itself. And last we have gastronoma. Um, so this is what's commonly called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. That's just one to commit to memory. It's the same thing, gastronoma and Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. So the cell type is a G cell and the hormone is gastrin, which is really easy. G stands for gastrin. So there's no, no difficulties memorizing that one. And so the high yield findings here are gastric ulcers. So multiple numerous ulcers, especially if you have an ulcer distal to the duodenum. So most ulcers will be in the duodenum or more proximal. 95% of ulcers happen in the duodenum. If you have one in the jejunum, that is a huge red flag. They're trying to alert you of a gastrinoma. Or if you have multiple gastric ulcers, that's another hint. Um, and then malabsorption because the excess gastric acid and HCL that's produced by gastrin affects the ability for pancreatic enzymes like pancreatic lipase and it inactivates them. So malabsorption and steatorrhea occur. Those are less high yield, but they're pretty, they're still pretty high yield in the sense that people don't realize that the gastric acid inactivating pancreatic enzymes causing diarrhea is a very classic presentation of gastrinoma if they're not going to go after the ulcers themselves. So let's move on to multiple endocrine neoplasia. So the question we talked about said MEN1. So let's start there. So the syndrome is MEN1, and the gene is the MEN1 gene, which codes for the MENIN protein. And so the features are the classic triad of parathyroid adenoma, pancreatic endocrine tumors, all of which we discussed prior, and a pituitary adenoma. And so those are the three Ps of MEN1. And so that one is pretty standalone. You just have to keep the parathyroid adenoma as it can be a little confusing with MEN2A. So MEN2A and MEN2B both have a common gene mutation, which is the RET gene, which leads to uptake and increased tyrosine kinase activity. So let's start with MEN2A. You have parathyroid hyperplasia. So both of these can cause parathyroid hyperparathyroidism, but it's all four of the glands hypertrophying or undergoing hyperplasia versus MEN1, where it's a parathyroid adenoma most of the time, as well as medullary thyroid cancer. So the calcitonin producing medullary, medullary thyroid version of cancer and pheochromocytoma. And then MEN2B, same mutation, same medullary thyroid cancer, same pheochromocytoma, but different in that you have mucosal neuromas, so lesions within the skin and marfanoid habitus, which is long extremities, um, hyperextensible skin and joints, et cetera. And so if you notice, all of the distinguishing features are highlighted from these three syndromes. If you keep the highlighted portions of these syndromes straight, you will almost rarely miss any of these questions. And the tricky but easy part is that all of these are inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. So if you see a primary family member, especially a parent with one of these syndromes, on a test question, it's guaranteed that they're going to have this syndrome. And so it's a huge, huge hint when they give you the inheritance or when they give you one of these syndromes, if they give you a family member that's affected. So while we're on this topic, let's do another practice question. 55 year old male presents at the clinic for routine follow up, no significant past medical history, and was previously healthy. Um, you can continue reading, but this is essentially the same question as previous. So the Last sentence is the only thing that's different here. So which of the following would he have an increased likelihood of developing in the future? So we know this patient has MEN1, 
And now we're trying to figure out which one he has an increased likelihood of developing. So we have A, pheochromocytoma, B, renal cell carcinoma, C, pituitary adenoma, D, mucosal neuromas, or an E, a schwannoma. I'll pause here briefly. So the answer here is C, pituitary adenoma. So if you remember, MEN1 is the three Ps, pituitary adenoma, parathyroid adenoma, as well as pancreatic endocrine tumors. A, which is a pheochrysis chromocytoma, would be present in MEN2A two or MEN2B. Two Renal cell carcinoma is not in any of these syndromes, but you can see it in von Hippel-Lindau VHL syndrome. Mucosal neuromas would have been MEN2B, and then schwannomas, can often be found in neurofibromatosis too, but not in any of these syndromes. So you'll often see questions like these where they put together a syndrome and put together or throw answer choices from various different syndromes. And they're basically asking, do you have these syndromes separate in your brain? And so here again is the slide. So MEN1, parathyroid adenoma, pancreatic endocrine tumors, and pituitary adenomas are the main features. And that's what we saw in the last example. And the inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant. So the patient's father had it. And so in the practice question or in the question that they're going to give you, almost always the patient has that and they're going into that condition. If instead it said parathyroid hyperplasia and left out some of the other information about MEN1, you may think it's MEN2A instead of MEN1. So here's a summary slide that'll keep these straight in your head. And so we have all three of the men's syndromes. We have highlighted here, we have each of the three classic triad they like you to go after. And highlighted in their specific color is the distinguishing feature, which is the easiest way to remember these syndromes. And they're highlighted in the affected portion of the body. So the pituitary, the parathyroid, but remember it is specifically adenoma more often than hyperplasia and then pancreatic tumors. Versus MEN2A, you have pheochromocytomas, which are tumors of the adrenal gland. You have diffuse parathyroid hyperplasia more commonly than an adenoma. And you also have medullary thyroid cancer, which is why the whole thyroid gland is highlighted. And then lastly, MEN2B, you have the mucosal neuromas, which appear like lesions on the skin, the features of morphinoid habitus, which are hyperlastable, hyperelastic skin and joints, and then you have the adrenal gland tumors of pheochromocytomas. So this is a good summary slide if you want to visually keep these straight in your head and keep them separate. Let's do another practice question here. A 24-year-old male presents to the clinic to establish care. He has no significant past medical history and was previously healthy. He is six foot six inches tall and weighs 190 pounds. He reports significant anxiety at his new job and describes recurrent episodes of severe anxiety, headaches, and dizziness at work. His laboratory studies are relatively unremarkable. Vital signs are unremarkable as well. Physical exam reveals numerous circumscribed skin growths. Which of the following most likely represents this clinical presentation? A, an isolated pituitary adenoma. B, MEN1. C, MEN2A. D, MEN2B or E, isolated insulinoma. I'll pause here. So the answer to this one was men to be. And so remember, look for the distinguishing features and you know that morphinoid habitus, which a common hint they throw at you for morphinoid habitus is not going to be the classic findings. It will be an extremely or abnormally tall person relative to the standard people they present to you on an exam. That, in addition to the numerous circumscribed skin growths where there was a description of mucosal neuromas, that alone, if you remember, that could have gotten you this question right. But in addition, they gave you these recurrent episodes of severe headache, anxiety, and dizziness. So that is a classic, classic presentation of pheochromocytomas. The four Ps instead of the three Ps, pain, pallor, pressure, and perspiration occurs when the catecholamines are being released into the bloodstream. And so some of you may be asking, well, laboratory studies were relatively unremarkable and vital signs were unremarkable. Wouldn't he have hypertension? Wouldn't he have associated renal problems from having such significant hypertension? And this is a common way that they test this. When catecholamines are secreted into the system, they're often done so in an episodic manner. So you won't have chronic long-standing hypertension, which can damage the kidneys. You'll have episodic exactly how this presented, recurrent episodes, and he's totally 
he's totally asymptomatic at the time of presentation, but he describes these episodes. And so that's a common way they test it. It won't look like it's standard chronic hypertension a lot of the time. So you know that MEN2A could have had the pheochromocytoma, but instead of the marfanoid presentation, you would have had a parathyroid presentation. Whether it's hyperplasia or adenoma, they would have given you uh, excess calcium, maybe some stones, bones, and groans, the classic hypercalcemia presentation, but you would not have had findings that, that clue you in to MEN2B. So now we've covered the pancreatic tumors, we've covered the MEN syndromes, and now we'll just finalize here with a couple of thoughts on how to approach these questions. So if you assimilate the pertinent findings, which we talked about, were the classic presentations that they want you to go after and understand which manifestation they represent. So for example, that classic four P's syndrome that you just saw, that you need to correlate with a pheochromocytoma. When you do that, it simplifies how fast these questions can get done in your head. And then if you do that, you can remember the differences from each syndrome and then once you've done that, you can connect each syndrome to the inheritance pattern and gene mutation, because sometimes they go after the inheritance pattern or gene mutation and add other syndromes. And so you can start from either end of the spectrum and go back and forth. When you have all this down, you can easily transition between various different questions that target gene mutation, that target presentation, that target differences between syndromes, and it won't be any problem whatsoever. And so we'll finish here with some final points. So each pancreatic endocrine neoplasm has a cell type mutation. So clue in on those. And you'll remember based on your understanding of physiology that each of those cells normally produces a hormone. And so this neoplasm is just an excess production of the hormone that's normally produced by that cell. And all three of the men's syndromes have a classic triad of findings. In real life, there are more than just the triads and there are a lot of overlap that they don't talk about on the exams. But for the purposes of NBME exams, these classic triads are the most vast majority of the way they go after these questions. And then last, again, remember exceptions. I cannot stress that enough. That makes each syndrome unique and you don't have to spend time keeping track of all the ways that the syndromes overlap. That's great for own personal knowledge and for clinical practice, but on the exams, they're always, always gonna test the differences between these syndromes and that'll help you keep these straight. So if you found these this video helpful and would like more content like this in the future, feel free to drop a like or comment down below if you have any further suggestions for videos in the future.